Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I hope you're well. Uh, and uh, I hope you're well and all is uh, wonderful for you today on our Sunday afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for our presentation of Story Theater. These are some of our, our younger young artists and they're gonna present to you uh, a wonderful uh, collection of Aesop's fables and uh, Brothers Grimm fairy tales some of them, most of them, you probably won't know. Uh, so they're a lot of fun. Uh, so I wanted to welcome you and thank you for being here. And I also uh, wanted to let you know a few things that are happening with J Company uh, before we start. So the first thing that I want to tell you about is tomorrow night, tomorrow at 5.30, we're having our Young Artists Showcase. Uh, it's our J Company Young Artists Showcase. It's our third one. It, it'll be still, uh, streamed right here on Facebook. And uh, we have got a wonderful, wonderful uh, plethora of young performers for you tomorrow night. And we hope you all joining us. Uh, some alumni will be there, some teachers will be singing with us, some current members, and it's gonna be really, really wonderful. So 5.30 PM right here on Facebook. We hope you'll join us for that. And uh, also this week, uh, we are having virtual auditions uh, for our first production of the season, which is going to be Macbeth. Yeah, we tackle the hard things first, right? <laughs> Nothing light for us in the beginning. Uh, so we'll be starting out the season with Macbeth. That'll happen in the fall. Um, we're probably going to do some outdoor theater. Uh, and we'll also be live streaming that as well. And then uh, our auditions for J Company on the Town, our ambassador group, are next week. And we're very excited about uh, bringing that back to us as well. Uh, our ambassadors are very excited uh, to be representing us, I'm sure. And then later in August, we'll also be having auditions for a brand new play called Magic in the Attic that was written by Bess Weldon. And uh, we're premiering the West Coast premiere right here in San Diego. So we're very happy to be doing that as well. So uh, there's a lot going on with J Company. We're still gonna have virtual programming. We're still gonna have virtual play readings. So keep your eyes peeled for those. Uh, but uh, right now, this is where we're headed. So uh, I am, so happy to be able to introduce to you our wonderful cast of characters, our fantastic actors for this particular show. Uh, so when I do, they're gonna come on and give you a little wave and uh, then we'll start the show, all right? Sounds good. So uh, to, let's see, our first actor is Shoshana Rafi. There she is, there's Shosh, good to see you, my love. And our next young actor is Mr. Brody Testa. There he is. And um, our third is Justin Roach. Hi, Justin, good to see you. All right. And our fourth young lady, fourth young lady here acting for us is Maeve McAvoy. There she is, good to see you, Maeve. And we also have Benji Katsky. Hey, Benji, good to see you. All right. <laughs> and uh, also we bring you Hadaria Levy. There she is, good to see you, Hadaria. And uh, Sophia and Amdar, there she is, very good to see you. Um, uh, the beautiful Miss Ava Muckle is here. There's the beautiful Miss Ava Muckle, there she is. And uh, two of our youngest cast members, Addison Patrick. Hi Addison, good to see you. And Chloe Wong is gonna be performing for you today as well. There's, there's Chloe, good to see you. Her virtual background on and ready to go. <laughs> it's awesome. All right, my friends. So here's what's gonna happen. Uh, we're going to do a series of different uh, stories for you. And I need to allow uh, our young actors time to change. So you get to hear a little bit of fun music while we get ready. So enjoy uh, this little snippet of music uh, while they get ready. Thank you very much. Sorry, I messed something up already. I messed something up already. Can you believe it? <laughs> oh my goodness. Dum -dum 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 -dum. We gonna have some fun now. The Bremen Town Musicians. A certain man had an ass, which for many years carried sacks of flour to the mill without tying them. At last, however, its strength gave out and it was no longer of any use for work. So its owner began to ponder as to how best to cut down on the ass's rations and indeed how to do away with the beast entirely. 
But the ass, hee-haw, sensing mischief in the air, broke from its quarters and ran away on the road to Bremen. There, he thought, I shall become a town musician. He had been traveling a short time. He fell in with a hound, who was in the road, panting as though he had run himself off his legs. Why are you panting so, Growler? Just because I'm so old and every day I get weaker and weaker all the time. My master wanted to kill me. I'll tell you what, Growler. I, myself, am on my way to Bremen. There, I shall become a town musician. It occurs to me that you can come along with me. I shall play the lute and you can beat the kettle drum. Boom, boom, boom? Yes. Yes. Very well then, let's be on our way. So the two began on their journey. A short time later, they came upon a cat who was sitting in the road with a face as long as a wet week. The hound goes to the cat, barking. <laughs> the cat arches its back and spits and claws at the hound. <laughs> the hound runs away, whining. The ass gets between the two and tries to make peace. Sit, sit. Why are you so unhappy, Whiskers? Who can be happy when one's whiskers are as white as an old man's beard? I'm getting, I'm getting along in my years. My teeth are blunted out. I prefer to sit by a nice warm fire and, <laughs> instead of, instead of hunting round after rice. <laughs> Have you ever tasted a mouse? Just because of this, my mistress wants to drown me. Well, miss, I have a suggestion. We, too, are on our way to Bremen, there to become town musicians. It occurs to me that you are a great hand at serenading. Oh, thank you. Yes, why don't you come along with us and take a part in the music? All right. Let's be off. So, the three began their journey once more. After a short while, the hound and the cat began to fight. <laughs> Just then, a rooster approached them. You crow so loud, you pierce one through and through. Yes, I do. Don't I? What is the matter? What's the matter? This Sunday's visitors are coming tomorrow. My mistress has ordered to cook the soup, to cook me into soup. Soup, chicken soup. There, there now, Redcomb. I may have a suggestion for you. We three are on our way to Bremen, there to become town musicians. Now you have a fine voice and when the four of us make music, there will be quality in it. So why don't you come along? All right. Let's go then, but stay in line. So the four went off together. They could not, however, reach Bremen in one day, and by night they arrived at a wood where they meant to spend the night. It's obvious we can't reach Bremen in one day. Why don't we stay here? So the ass and the hound lay under a tree. And they all lay down. While the cock flew up to the top branches. A light, a light, Tom, I see a light. It must be a house. If there's a house, there's a bow. And maybe some tuna. Very well then. Let's sit out, but be very quiet. So they set out in the direction of the light till they reached a brightly lighted robber's den. Perhaps I should look in the window before we just barge in there. Watch out. Be careful. What do you see? What did I see? Why, I saw a table laden with delicious food and drink and robbers enjoying it. Oh, if only that were us. It could be us. I have a plan. The ass, the hound, and the cat 
were to form a triangle underneath the window, and the cock was to jump onto their backs and through the window. All four were then to perform their music. The ass brayed. Hee-haw! The hound barked. <laughs> the cat meowed. <laughs> and the cock crowed. The robbers jumped up at the terrible noise and fled into the fled from the cottage into the woods. The animals then went to the table and began to eat the food. After supper, the ass lay down on a pile of straw. The dog under the table. The cat, the cat, stretched out by the fire. flew up to the top branches. Soon the robbers returned. Such saps to run out like that. I hadn't finished eating yet. One of us has to return. That's right. Be careful. I'll wait for you here. What do you mean? Get in there immediately and report back. Seeing all was dark, the robber crept inside the broken window to strike a light, taking the cat's glowing eyes for coals. He held a match to light them. But the cat would stand no nonsense. It flew at its face, spat and scratched. He was terribly frightened and ran away. He tried to get out the back door, but the hound who was lying there jumped up and bit his leg. <laughs> As he ran across the pile of straw in front of the house, the ass gave him a good sound kick with his hind legs. Hee-haw! While the cock, who had awakened at the uproar, quite fresh and gay, cried out from his perch. <laughs> Thereupon, the robber ran back as fast as he could to his friend. What happened? There is a gruesome witch in the house who breathes on me and scratches me with her long fingers. Under the table, there stands a man with a knife who stabbed me and great hairy devil who hit me with a club. And on the roof, a judge sits, bring the wild hair. So I ran away as fast as I could. Let's get out of here. We'll never go back there again. And so the four Bremen Town musicians were very pleased with their new house. And they never had to leave it again. One dark night, two friends met in a graveyard. Milton! Morris! Where are you going? I'm going over to that field to steal me a nice fat sheep. What are you doing here? I'm digging up the nuts that are buried under my dear old mother's head. What kind are they? Walnuts. That's my favorite nut. I tell you what, you share that sheep with me and I'll share my walnuts with you, and we can have a feast. All right, it's a deal. I'm off to get my sheep. So the man continued to dig up the walnuts buried under his dear mother's head. Finding the nuts, 
he crossed the porch of the church to eat them. It was the custom of the sexton to pass through the churchyard on his way to ring the midnight hour. Parson! 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 Why me? At this time of night? <sighs> Who could be calling me? Parson, there's a monster in the graveyard chewing on the bones of the dead! Well, come inside, man. I can't. I must toll the midnight bell. Yes, you sound the alarm. I'll pray for you here. No, Parson, you must come with me. <sighs> I cannot come with you. I am busy trimming wits, and I have this terrible ter gout upon me. Can't oh, hear you. Yeah. Ugh. All right then. Sexton hoisted the parson onto his back. And so the two returned to the graveyard together. When they reach the graveyard, the first man hears them. The man thought it was his friend returning with the sheep. Hey, is he a fat one? Yes! And you can have him. Sexton drops the parson and runs off. Cocky, locky, ducky, and ducky daddles. We're going to tell the king the sky is falling. Can I go too? Why, Why certainly. certainly. So they went along, and they went along, and then they met. Lurky, lurky. Where are you going, Henny Penny, Cocky, locky, Duckle, Dolls, and Goosey Pussy? We're going. To tell the king the sky is falling. May I go with you? Why, Why is it falling? So they went along and they went along and then they met Foxy Waxy. Hey there, Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Pussy, and Turkey Lurkey. Where are all you birds going? We're going to tell the king the sky is falling. Oh, the sky. Yes, I've noticed that myself. The sky. Well, you're going the wrong way. If you want to know the right way to the king, why don't all you birds just get together and follow me? Why, why certainly. certainly. I certainly. 
here's the way to the kid. But there's just a little hole that you have to go through. Let's call it a hole. There's only room for one at a time through that little hole. So I can lead each one of you through that little hole. It's to be first. I want to. I have a volunteer. Follow me. All right, who's next to tell the king? Me, 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 me. Yeah, yes, you. Charming little tale, my dear. Right this way. Honk. Who's next? Who wants to be next? Me, 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 me. Pick me, pick me, me next to you. Please, 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 please. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Follow me. Quack, quack. All right, who is next? I'll go. Go, go. Follow me. Be time to lay my eggs. She never did tell the king the sky was falling. Brat. <laughs> This is the story of Venus and the cat. According to Aesop, a man once had a cat, which he loved very much. Whereupon the man took her to his bed. Seeing this, Venus, the goddess of love, Changed the cat into a beautiful woman. Whereupon the man took her to his bedchambers. A game came into the mind of Venus, and she set loose in the bedchambers a little gray mouse. Oh, a mouse. I'll get it. That's all right, darling. I'll get it. Rah! Oh, oh, good. You got it. Just fling it out there. Just toss the old mouse out the old window. But instead, the cat eats the mouse. <laughs> then Venus changed the cat back and in, back into a cat. And the love affair ended. Because no one likes to kiss someone with mouse breath. We're gonna have some fun now
There once was a fisherman who lived with his wife in a rundown shack by the sea. And every day he'd go fishing in the briny deep. And one day he was sitting about half asleep. He felt a big one tugging on his line. Finally, he pulled in the flounder. Listen, fisherman, I'm not a common flounder. I'm an enchanted princess. Throw me back into the sea water. I shan't be good to eat. That's all right. I throw back all fish that talk. So saying, the flounder swam back into the sea. Then the fisherman got up and went back to his wife in their hovel. Husband. Why? Have you caught anything today? No. All I caught was uh, one flounder, but she said she was an enchanted princess, so... I threw her back. Did you not wish for anything? Uh, no. Uh, what was there to wish for? Isn't it bad enough that we have to live in this wretched, filthy hovel? You might at least have wished for a nice, clean cottage. She will surely grant you that. No, wife. What am I to go there back for? <laughs> well, it was you who caught her and let her go again. She will certainly do that much for you. Be off! and go ask. All right, I'll ask. The man was still not very willing to go, but he did not want to vex his wife, and at last he went back to the sea. He found the sea no longer bright and shining, but dull and green. Hmm. Flounder, flounder in the sea. Pretty hearken unto me. Isabel, my willful wife, does not want my way of life. Hello, fisherman. Hello, flounder. I had to call you back for my wife. Said that since I was the one that caught you, I should have wished for something. Of course, fisherman. What would she have? She wants a nice, clean cottage. Go home. She has her wish fully. The man went home and found his wife no longer in the old hut. But a pretty little cottage stood in its place. Husband, come inside. Come and see. There was a pretty sitting room and a bedroom. With a brass bed. And a kitchen. With a larder full. Outside there were chickens and ducks and geese and a big fat rabbit. With vegetables and fruit trees. Is this not nice? Yes, and let it so remain. You and I shall live in this little cottage very happily. You shall see about that. And with that, they ate something. And went to bed. The next morning, I went. What, what, what? Wake up. This cottage is too cramped. Go to the flounder and tell her I've changed my mind. I want to live in a in a big stone castle. Yeah. Go to the flounder and tell her to give us a castle. You want a big stone castle? Right. I'll ask him. The man's heart was heavy and he went unwillingly. He said to himself, Not right. Just not right. When he reached the sea, he found the sea was no longer green. It was still calm, but dark violet and gray. A strong wind was coming up. Flounder, flounder in the sea, prithee hearken unto me. Isabel, my willful wife, does not want my way of life. Hello, fisherman. Oh, flounder, the cottage was lovely. You're welcome. No, flounder, wait. My wife has changed her mind. She wants a big stone castle. Go home. She's waiting at the gates of it.
The man went away thinking that he would find no house. But when he got back, he found a great stone palace and his wife was standing at the top of the steps waiting to go in. Husband, come in with me. The walls were hung with beautiful tapestry. Rich carpets covered the floors. The tables grown under every kind of delicate food and the most costly wines. Outside the house was a great courtyard, half a mile wide, and beyond that was a forest and park with tags and hides and hares. And everything that one could wish for. Now is, now is this not worth having? Yes, and let it so remain. We will live in this beautiful palace and be content. We shall think about that. And with that, they went to bed. The next morning. Husband! Ah, uh, what? Peep out of the window. Wouldn't you like to be king over all this land? Go to the flounder, tell her that you consent to be the king. No, I don't want to be the king. What? No. Why should I want to be the king? All right, that's all right, it's all right. I'll be the king. Then the wife exited quickly before her husband could argue with her. So the fisherman went, but he was quite sad because his wife would be the king. Not right. It's just not right. When he reached the open sea, he found it dark, gray, rough, and evil smelling. A storm was raging. Oh. Flounder, flounder in the sea. Pretty hearken unto me, is that my local wife does not want my way of life. What now, fisherman? My wife would be the king. She is the king. Flounder bounds away. But the fisherman runs after him, crying. But the flounder would not wait. And when the man got home, he found his wife, the king, waiting for him. Wife, are you now the king? Yes, now I am the king. What a wondrous thing to be the king. No, husband, it's not. I find that being king makes time weigh heavy on my hands. I cannot bear it any longer. I am the king, but it's not enough. I must be Pope. Wife, I think this is truly beyond the flounder. Nonsense. If he can make a king, he, she can make a Pope. There is only one Pope in all of the world. I'm not going to ask that fish to make you the Pope. Do you forget to whom you are speaking? I am the king. You are but my husband. You must obey. So he was frightened, but he was quite dazed. He shivered and shook and his knees trembled. A great wind arose across the land. The clouds flew across the sky and it grew as dark as the night. The leaves fell from the trees and the water foamed and dashed upon the shore. In the distance, the ships were being tossed to and fro on the waves. There was a little patch of blue in the sky among the dark clouds. But towards the south, they were red and heavy as in a bad storm. Flounder, flounder in the sea, prithee hearken unto me. Isabel, my willful wife, does not want my way of life. Now what does she want? My wife wants to be the Pope. Say that again. My wife to be the Pope. Go home, fisherman. Your wife is now the Pope. So, so back he went, and when he got home, he found that his wife had become the Pope. <sighs> wife, are you now the Pope? Yes, now we are the Pope. I pray you, now, Content yourself 
to be the Pope. Higher you cannot go. We shall think about that. And with that, they went to bed. The fisherman, kneeling at his wife's feet, curled up to go to sleep. The wife slash Pope remained standing in an attitude of prayer. When the dawn reddened and the sun began to rise, she looked out of the window and began to cry. Why cannot I cause the sun and the moon to rise? Why? Husband! Uh, what? Go to the flounder, tell her I will be the, the ruler of the universe. What did you say? Wake up! If I cannot cause the sun and the moon to rise and set, I shall not be able to bear it. Wife, the flounder cannot do that. Remain the Pope. You make a nice Pope. Then she flew into a terrible rage. She kicked him and screamed. Ah! I won't bear it any longer. Now go. Then he pulled on his trousers and tore away like a madman. Such a storm was raging that, that he could hardly keep on his feet. Houses and trees quivered and swayed and the mountains trembled. The rocks rolled into the sea. The sky was pitchy black. It thundered and lightened and the sea ran in black waves, mountains high crested with white foam. He shrieked out but could hardly make himself heard. Flounder in the sea, prithee hearken unto me. Is the will my willful wife does not want my way of life? Uh, now, what does she want? My wife wants to be the ruler of the universe. No, fisherman, this time it cannot be. Now you must return to your hovel by the sea. There once was a fisherman who lived with his wife in a rundown shack by the sea. And every day he'd go fishing in the briny deep. And he'd sit there fishing about half asleep. And he'd fish and he'd fish. The Tale of the Two Crows. According to Aesop, there was once a crow who found a mussel on the beach, but he, but he could not for the life of him open the shell to get the fish. A brother crow, seeing this, said, Ha, oh, you're doing it all wrong. Oh? Yes, if I were you, I'll take it out about 10,000 feet and drop it here on these rocks. So the crows looked around and then down at the mussel. With a shrug, the first crow picks up the mussel and flies upward. Higher, 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 now drop it. It worked! It worked! Aww.
Once there was a widow who had three sons. The youngest of whom was called Simpleton. He was scorned and despised by the others. And always kept in the background. Go on, get in the background. One day the eldest son went into the forest to cut wood. But before he left, his mother gave him a nice sweet cake and a bottle of wine to take with him so that he might not suffer from hunger or thirst on his way. Uh, on his way, suddenly, there was a little gray man. Good afternoon, kind young sir. I wonder if you might have a piece of cake, a drop of wine to share with a hungry and thirsty old man. If I give you any of my cake and my wine, I shan't have enough for myself. So be off with you. The little gray man left quickly, waving his hand at the sun as he left. The sun had not been long at work cutting down a tree. Before he made a full stroke, he dug the axe into his own arm. He was obligated to run home and have it bound. My arm, my arm, ow! This was no accident. This was caused by the little gray man. So the second son had to go out into the forest to cut wood. But before he left, his mother gave him a sweet cake and a bottle of wine so that he might not suffer from hunger or thirst on his way. While on his way, there was the little gray man. Good afternoon, kind young sir. I wonder if you might have a piece of cake and a drop of wine to share the hungry and thirsty old man. I have some cake and I have some wine, but I am not going to share it with a hungry and thirsty old man, so be off. The little gray man left quickly. But the second son's punishment was not long delayed. After a few blows at the tree, he hit his own leg. Ow! Guess who? to go into the forest to cut down trees. Simpleton, you know nothing about it. You only hurt yourself. But you never even let me go outside. Shall we let him go outside? Go ahead, and when you hurt yourself, you'll be all the wiser for it. Thank you, brothers, thank you. Don't forget your ax. But before he left, his mother gave him a cake, which was baked with water and made in the ashes, and a bottle of sour beer. Simpleton, please be careful. When he reached the forest like the others, he met the little gray man. Good afternoon, kind young sir. I wonder if you might have a piece of cake and a drop of wine. To share the hungry and thirsty old man. I'm afraid all I have is cake mixed with water and baked in the ashes of a bottle of sour beer. But if you like such fare, I'll be glad to share it with you. The two sat and ate. But when Simpleton pulled out his beer, it turned into a nice wine. And so they ate and they drank. Just then, the... The little gray man turned into a beautiful enchantress. You've shared your stuff with you. You are pure of heart. You are pure of heart. So I will bring you luck. Over yonder in the forest stands an old, old tree. Cut it down and you will find something in his roots. And that's when the little gray man disappeared. Simpleton went into the forest where he, had, where he had eaten because he forgot his axe. He went back into the forest and found the old tree, telling the birds what he's planning to do. He convinced them to leave the tree. Then he cut the tree down. Oh God! A goose with golden feathers! 
So Simpleton and the goose went to an inn where they planned to stay the night. All right, little goose, lie down. Time to go to bed. The innkeeper had two daughters. When they saw the golden goose, they were very curious as to what kind of bird it could be and wanted to get one of its golden feathers. This is my opportunity to get a feather. I'm the eldest. But as the eldest sister reached to pluck a feather, she found that her hand was stuck fast. Hurry up, sister. I want to get one too. No, sister, stay away. It's some kind of strange bird. Don't be so selfish. Why shouldn't I have one if you have one? But as soon as she reached to touch her sister, she found that her hand was stuck fast too. And in this manner, they had to spend the night. In the morning, Simpleton picked up the goose without even noticing the two girls stuck on behind and set out into the forest. In the middle of the forest, they met the parson. Shame, shame on you two young girls chasing after that young man like that. Come away, come away immediately. If you don't come away, I'll have to pull you away. The parson grabbed the younger sister to pull her away, but no sooner had he touched her that he felt himself stuck fast and he too had to run behind. As he passed the church, the sexton said, hello, your reverence, where are you going so fast? It's almost time for his vespers. So saying, he plucked the parson by the sleeve and soon found that he could not get away. A simple peasant came along the road. Ha, ha, ha. Give us a hand, simple peasant. The peasant went to help them and grabbed onto the sexton's hand, but immediate, immediately he too was stuck fast. So now there are five people running behind Simpleton as his goose. By and by, they came to a town where ruled a king, whose only daughter was sad and morose. I'm so sad and morose that nothing and nobody can make me laugh. So the king proclaimed that whoever could make his daughter laugh should marry her. Whoa! <laughs> when Simpleton heard this, he took his goose with all the people attached before her. And when she saw these five people running, one behind the other, she burst into fits of laughter and seemed as if, as if it could never <laughs> stop. <laughs> <laughs> you have made my daughter laugh. I now pronounce you a man and wife. Give me the goose. You won't need it on your honeymoon. So the king took the goose and the five people. And left Simpleton and the princess to their honeymoon. Come back on camera, everybody. Come back on camera, everybody. Give a big bow to the audience. Uh, it, it, this is the time. <laughs> you did a very good job. This is a crazy play. Uh, this is the time, uh, since you're watching us on Facebook, if you have any questions or if you want to uh, say, ask anything of these wonderful, wonderful actors, we have a good 10 minutes maybe left uh, and they can answer your questions, we'll get them to us. But in the meantime, um, I wanted to know uh, from each of you, I'll uh, say your name, uh, which story was your favorite story? Which one did you like the best? Let's just go uh, up, the, up the thing. Let's go here. Addison, what was your favorite story, my friend? Um, I actually, I think my favorite story actually may be Henny Penny. Oh, it's a fun one. That's a fun one. What about you, Chloe? I love the same thing what Addison said. <laughs> Very good. And Ava? Probably is he fat because it's so crazy. Weird, right? It's weird. It's such a bizarre one. Sophia, what was your favorite story? I think I might know. My favorite story is Venus and the Cat. So <laughs> I love your Sophia Begara hair flip when you come in. It's great. <laughs> uh, uh, Hadaria, what's your favorite story? Um, I think my favorite is the fisherman story because it's kind of has a good message to it. Yeah, right? Some of them, I mean, you have to kind of really dig for the message in some of the stories. Not in that one. That's pretty simple. <laughs> All right. Uh, Maeve, what's your favorite one? 
Oh, you're on mute, my love. My favorite one is probably the Golden Goose because I play the biggest part in it. It's And it's funny, you know, I need to tell everybody, you know, the, the idea of you turning into the Enchantress, that was all you. It's not in the script and she just made it her own. So good job, Maeve, that was really very good. Uh, Benji, what's your favorite? Uh, it's probably the Golden Goose because it's just like, it's such like, it's a funny story and also, and yeah. Yeah, it's funny. All right, it's very funny. Justin, what about you, my friend? Where are you? There you are. My favorite story was the Bremen Towns musician. Oh, that's a silly one. I like your puppy dog is really good. Your little hound dog is so fun. Oh my gosh. Okay, Brody. I like the Bremen Town musicians too. Um, I like it because um, I get to go crazy when the animals attack me. So. Fun, right? That was really fun. I, when I told you you were doing that, you were like, what? <laughs> What's happening? Shosh, what's your favorite, my friend? Um, mine was probably the golden goose because I had to learn how to fake laugh. And that is definitely a skill that I will need in the near future. You get so. a nod, so you'll be doing a lot of fake laughing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I hear it all the time, sadly. But <laughs> um, so we do have a question. This is from Crystal. Crystal Hart. Crystal's watching us. So she said, did each of you draw your own Zoom backgrounds and make your own costumes? Who wants to talk about costumes? Costume. Brody, tell me about costumes. Uh, yeah, so we just like gathered stuff that we had in the house. And if we didn't have anything, uh, we would order stuff from online. And for that virtual backgrounds, yes, we, we did draw them. I did, when I told, I told Ava and Brody, I was like, you got to do some artwork. So, and that was great. You guys did great. And I love that we figured out how to superimpose it for you. It's very good. Does anybody else want to talk about costumes really quick? We have a couple more questions. Shosh. Um, well, it was somewhat challenging, but it was also a really fun experience to try to be so creative and make stuff your own. Um, but it was pretty easy, wasn't too hard, and it was stuff that you had around the house. Yeah, and our goal, I think, was for it to be a creative process. You know, I didn't want you to all go out and buy like onesies and that's, you know, that's cheating, right? <laughs> Just have fun and make it funny. Your, like your beats, your animal beats were so great and so much fun. It was really well done, good job. Uh, Jennifer Tabak Levy wants to know, what was the hardest part about doing short short stories instead of one long play? So it's you know having little episodic stories rather than one long play. Sophia. Um, I think all of the transitions between the stories was the hardest part. Like you had to change your costume, you had to change your name, you had to change your just overall presence in the story. And it was a lot to remember and it was fun though. It was a lot to remember. Ava, did you have your hand up? I was gonna say what she said. <laughs> okay, very good. All right, Benji, or, Bro, or Brody, sorry. Uh, yes, definitely the transitions with the changing in the costumes and you have to change your name, but also you're like, you're like changing character. Like you're acting differently every time. And you're like, wait, I was just that character and now I'm that character. So yeah, and you had to convince the, the audience the moment your camera comes on who you are, because they'll remember you from the last one, right? Yeah, Shosh, what's your answer? And of course, the complications of Zoom, how hard it can be, unmuting yourself, turning your camera off, the lag. Yeah, that's always fun. Hopefully we won't be on it forever, <laughs> but it'll be fun. Um, so uh, Carolee McAvoy wants to know, how much practice did it take to pass the picnic basket? <laughs> How much when you pass the picnic basket? Shosh, yeah. Um, well, actually, here's mine. It wasn't, I mean, the only thing that I did was I, um, this used to be holding our napkins, um, but I just held it in front of me, brought it to the camera, and then over the camera, and then they just took it. That is, I will say that is one thing that we learn through Zoom is how to pass objects through a camera. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. Brody. Um, I had this basket and it was like wrapped up up here. So um, there would just be a basket sitting on top of a monitor. You always have your basket on your monitor? No. No. <laughs> Justin, what do you have to say, my friend? Um, 
So at first, when we passed the picnic basket, it was kind of hard because we didn't think of the idea to do it. So I just had to hold the picnic basket. Um, I had to put it on the table and then I had to carry it through the camera. But then my mom thought an idea of her just holding it above the camera and then I can just take it from her. See, it's good when you have, you know, someone helping you out sometimes, right? Very helpful, very helpful. All right, guys, so that, that is the, the magic of our Zoom reading. And those are our questions. You guys did really well. Give yourselves a big round of applause. You were fantastic uh, taking on these crazy, you know, enchanted flounders and flying crows and wonderful laughing princesses and stuff. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, audience, for being here and supporting J Company. And remember, uh, tomorrow night, 5.30, uh, show up and see our wonderful J Company showcase. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Bye.